Welcome to Endwell Live, where each week we're having a conversation with a special guest about how in this truly unprecedented time of ongoing crisis, uh, we can collectively find community and best support those who are facing serious illness, support caregivers and families. I'm Shoshana Ungerleiter, a physician and the founder of Endwell, where we're focused on making the end of life a part of life. And I hope that you're all safe and healthy. And if not healthy, I do hope that you're on the mend. And we're coming to you today to find community in, in one another and support our physical and our emotional health during this uh, tough time through a virtual conversation. So today I have the pleasure of speaking with the incredible nurse, social worker, activist, Lady Bird Morgan, who's been working in end of life care and on the front lines of sexual violence as a registered nurse, a uh, clinical social worker and an educator for 20 plus years. She's worked with uh, the Zen Hospice Project, Hospice by the Bay, Marin General Hospital, Doctors Without Borders, and she's helped medical providers, families, and private caregivers, as well as directors of programs and institutions around the world to be present in the face of trauma. So we're going to talk for 20 minutes or so and then open it up to you, uh, our audience. So if you are joining us live today, hello, uh, please say hello in the comments below and tell us where you're from and please ask us questions and make comments throughout um, and then be sure to share this link on your own page. And we want others to join the conversation. So the more you're engaged, the more other people will tune in as well. And I want to thank the Cambia Health Foundation and the Tauber Family Foundation for their support of this program. So with that, hi, Lady Bird. How are you? Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Shoshana. It's really lovely to be a part of this conversation. I am well. I'm I'm living in the world. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, a, it's such a funny question to ask people, you know, nowadays, and it's it's hard to you know come up with an authentic answer, I think. But um, I'm glad to hear that you're you're well. Um, you're you're a co-founder of the Humane Prison Hospice Project. So um, as you know, you know we had one of your your other founders, Marvin Much, on the stage at Endwell last December, and your work resonated deeply, you know, with with our audience. Um, I'd love to know the origin story and the mission of the Humane uh, Hospice Prison Project. Um, well, the, the mission is really to bring humanity to the world in every way that we can. The we, Humane Prison Hospice Project, our intention is to train prisoners to provide bedside care to their fellow prisoners, inmates who are dying inside um, the prisons where they live, men and women. And it provides... Uh, a stepping stone to access humanity. It brings humanity to, to everyone involved. And that's our mission. Our hope is to bring it to all of California prisons. And in this moment with the coronavirus and the disasters that are happening in the California Department of Corrections, it feels like a very amazing moment to be able to offer this conversation and this possibility to the Department of Corrections as a way to um, bring some more humanity to the men and women who are incarcerated in our state, California. Um, we we brought this together because myself, Sandra, Sandra Fish, who is also the co-founder, and Marvin Much, um, we aligned in this one area, which was that everyone deserves to access humanity, and the men and women who are serving their time behind bars are humans, and it impacts them deeply when somebody dies. It, it's traumatic to die alone. It's traumatic to die without any services, and I would say that also the the caregivers, the medical professionals, and the correctional officers who are in these prisons are also human beings. And to be in an environment where you're not allowed to help in the ways that you might if you weren't in that environment is also very traumatic for them. And so bringing hospice programs into prisons is actually, um, it, it's, it heals and serves everyone involved, not just the person dying or the person providing the care. So beautiful. My goodness. Um, if you're just joining us, I'm talking with nurse, social worker, and activist Lady Bird Morgan, the co-founder of the Humane Prison Hospice Project. Please give this conversation a thumbs up, like, and share it on your own page so others can join. 
Um, Lady Bird, I, I understand that in, in addition to focusing on, on getting hospice projects inside prisons, you, you've trained a group of incarcerated men at San Quentin called uh, Brothers Keepers to be end of life volunteers. Um, from, from what I understand, both the men who are dying and the men who volunteer benefit from this work. Um, tell us about it. Yeah, so we were able to meet a group called the Brothers Keepers. Um, Sandy Fish, actually, who's really spearheaded all of this work in terms of pulling people together and getting things to continue to move forward, um, met the Brothers Keepers in the early 2010s, 2012. And um, this was a group self-formed in San Quentin by Marvin Much, actually, to provide peer support to each other around suicide prevention. And over all of those years, the men kept asking for skills around end of life. Could they please be taught how to deal with this? Because the men were dying alone in their cells. They were trying to hold that space for them and they didn't know how to do that. So we partnered with the Brothers Keepers and brought in end of life training with the support of Mission Hospice and Home Care and a remarkable team of um, palliative care and hospice care physicians, nurses, body care workers in San Quentin. And so this core group of Brothers Keepers were trained it was about 10 of them. And they are still, there is not a hospice program at San Quentin. So they were given the training. And what we did was we just talked about it a lot. We sat in a circle. We talked about what it was like to die. We talked about the experiences that we had and the experiences that they had had caring for people who had died. And um, our intention is to continue to request that there becomes a hospice program at San Quentin, but we didn't actually get to implement that um, in that way. Yeah. I mean, when I heard about that program, I was just blown away. I think we often forget um, that people who are in prison are are, are aging, that are uh, acquiring serious illnesses, and and then, of course, will reach the end of their lives. And so, you know, creating a space for, for people to help one another um, in, inside is just so, is so incredible. Um, yeah, I mean, according to the last statistics that we saw, a third, a third of the U.S. incarcerated population is elderly and aging behind bars. And that includes people with diabetes, comorbidities of cancer, high blood pressure, poor diets. I mean, you just name it. They, the aging increases, the stress, everything is compounded. And there are about 1,800 correctional facilities across the U.S. and only 4% of those have palliative care programs active. Um, in them. And so that's, that's a lot of people without support. Yeah. The prisoners and the med, I mean, I always do kind of, because I'm a medical professional, I do tend to think also about that as well, thinking there are people who are not getting services, but when a professional cannot provide the adequate services, that is also a stress. And so, you know, it's, it's both, it's both and. So we know, we've seen in the news, the pandemic uh, is hitting prisons very hard. Uh, over 2,000 people at San Quentin have te tested positive, I believe, as of yesterday. Can you share, are you, are you hearing anything from your contacts inside about this? You know, it's, it, the contacts is sort of interesting because we don't really particularly have contacts inside, but we have the group of men that, who we're not technically able to get access to. We've been sending letters into them, supporting them, trying to follow up. And what we hear back is what we get back from other um, men. There's one man who's actually a reporter, Juan, who I would love to actually read just a little paragraph of, of his personal experience, if that's okay, because he sent this out. He's a reporter in San Quentin. His name is Juan Moreno Haynes. Um, on June 27th at 11.51 a.m., a correctional officer came to my North Block cell and said that I tested positive for COVID-19. I was locked in cell 363. About an hour later, an announcement came over the PA system saying that prisoners are required to wear face masks when nurses show up to take temperatures. Showers and telephones were held up so that the 63 prisoners could be moved out of North Block to Badger Section. Badger Section once was a reception center for new prisoners to the prison system. My name came up as one of the 63. My cellie helped me pack all of my stuff and I pushed a collection of books and reporters notes and memorabilia away from the place where I lived for the last 13 years. When I got to Badger section, exhaustion, the kind that felt like pneumonia that comes from Legionnaire's disease, stung my lungs. I rested a little bit before taking my property to the third tier cell. A couple of youngsters saw me struggling and helped me. There was someone from North Block already in 314. We moved stuff around to accommodate each other. There's no electricity in the cells to power TVs or radios. There are only lights. It's like a dungeon. 
it goes on and I, I, I'm not gonna read the entire thing, but what really has happened is that, you know, the Department of Corrections has known for a long time that it's over, it's, it's overpopulated and this is not a place to deal with um, viruses in that way. And um, the men and women are, are terrified and they're suffering and they don't have access to their family members, um, to hot meals, to things that we would assume are happening. Um, so it's, it's actually, it's quite traumatic for them inside. Oh, well, thank you for, for sharing that bit of, of reality. Um, I, yeah, my, that's just heartbreaking to hear. Um, gosh, if, if you're just joining us, I'm talking with nurse, social worker, and activist Lady Bird Morgan. She's the co-founder of the Humane Prison Hospice Project. Please give this conversation a like, um, make any comments or questions as we go, and share this conversation on your own page so others can join us. Um, the world at large, Lady Bird, is catching up to this concept of, of intersectionality. What I mean by that is that multiple factors, identities, conditions uh, can be present in every individual, right? This seems obvious to some, but I think for years, public and private healthcare for sure uh, has generally been trying to squeeze people into one box, uh, whether it's demographic or medical or even spiritual. Um, you, you seem to have always been working in that world uh, with a much wider vision. Um, can you say a little bit about that? Um, yeah, it's a little hard to articulate. I, I, yeah. my, my first comment is to say we're all working, we're all operating in that world. Um, and I, I think what I've come to experience as I've gotten older and done the work that I've done is that um, it's actually easier to not segment out. The more I try to say like, well, this is when I talk about end of life and this is when I talk about sexual violence or this is a trauma conversation and this is a non-traumatic conversation is when I start to feel like I am no longer um, speaking my authentic voice and, and just being a human being. I'm now um, performing, I'm now fulfilling a role and that rarely serves the people that I'm speaking to. There's rarely a cross sort of, um, I don't want to say cross pollination, but there's they can't feel it. They can't experience what's what I'm actually talking about. So as I've done work as a social worker and a nurse in sexual violence and end of life, those two came together because I was really working with humans. I'm always working with human beings on the planet Earth. And those similarities I can relate to, even with tremendous differences around race and culture and class, gender. Um, those are other conversations, but the humanity is what I try to always come and relate to and from. And that's usually where somebody can respond back. Yeah. I wish I wish so many more people shared that perspective, right? Um, I think that's that's incredible. Um, well, th this leads me to to a question about your new venture with our dear mutual friend, Dr. BJ Miller, called Metal Health. What what is metal? Tell us about it. <laughs> Well, Metal Health is it's a new online palliative care support program. I think it's fantastic. Um, BJ Miller and Sonia Dolan brought this together. And the intention is to provide um, care and support to patients, caregivers, families, individuals, professionals around navigating, um, as Sonia likes to say, the existential elements, the emotional, the practical, the physical, what's happening in the healthcare system, all of the questions that everybody always has, that they're always dealing with, but they need to get a referral to speak to somebody. Um, and in this, with mental health, you don't need a referral from your doctor to have this private consultation. You can have the consultation, it'll be online, so in your home, or wherever you choose to have that conversation. And there will be a range of professionals from different backgrounds, um, medical, non-medical, emotional support, care, social workers, chaplains, doctors, nurses, um, that will be available to have these conversations that you don't normally get to have necessarily with your healthcare team or even your family. Yeah, it's such a phenomenal idea. When BJ and Sonia first told me about it, I was like, yes, we need yeah. this. So basically the idea is anyone, right, can go to the website, make an appointment, um, just as you would maybe to get a haircut or, you know, something else, right? And, and right. you schedule and then you actually get to virtually, 
right? Connect with a with a provider. Is that is that sort of the exactly? And the and the intention is that we are offering this as a group of people, and so it's not so much that someone calls just to speak to me or just to speak to Bridget, who's a social worker, or to BJ, who's a physician, but that you're calling for support, and whoever's available that day will be able to meet you where you're at. Um, so that's the intention, and yeah, it's it's great because it's the conversation that I love having that I've always wanted to have. And you rarely have that time when you're out in the professional world, in the field, you've got so many clients to see, or, you know, there's just varying complications that don't allow those conversations to happen. For sure. We'll share um, the website in the notes, uh, the comment section, so that people, if they want to check it out, can can visit the website. Um, you know, w- one of the big questions right now is, is how do we support people at end of life if we can't physically be there with them? Um, what, what's your experience been with this? What, what could you tell people out there? Well, interestingly, I, I just um, fought against that. I, my grandmother died yesterday, as I had told you, and one of the she's in a facility. And because of the coronavirus, I was told initially that I was only allowed to see her for an hour and to, that that would be it. And in my heart and in my body, that didn't feel right to me. It didn't, didn't actually make sense for safety reasons either. And so I actually went and I spent time with her and I was able to be with her. Um, similar to how we're pushing to get this care to happen in the prisons. What I would say is that for people to really listen deeply to themselves around what feels right and for them. There's health concerns, absolutely. And some of those things can be moved around and bent a little bit with protection and the right ways of hand washing and masks and all the things that we know about. There are ways to navigate in territory that feels scary and dangerous without completely retreating. So I would I would just you know offer that people before they retreat completely and think something's impossible, spread out a little bit further and see like what can actually happen in this space. Is there someone that can be there? Even if it's not you personally, but can somebody go and be with a person? And then on a more sort of existential level, remembering that there is this planet that we're all on and we are all landed on that same earth. And so there is a connection inherently present that we can experience if we sort of reach down and tap into that. But that's a bigger, it's a bigger <laughs> ask for most people. Yeah. Well, I am, gosh, we, we talked about this before, but I'm so sorry uh, for, for your, your loss and but goodness, what a blessing that you, you were able to be there and, and made the trip. Um, and I just so appreciate your, your openness, your willingness to come on the show right after. Um, I, it's just, you know, it just speaks to how amazing you are. Um, you know, I just feel human. It just feels like the human thing to do, you know? And I think to your point about coming on the show after the death, I mean, this is what life is about, right? Things are happening every day. We continue to move forward. I will still continue to have my grief and my process. It's not that it's done. And now I'm on a, a program in the morning, but, um, there's a, there's a continual motion that's happening um, and this feels very appropriate. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, if, if you're just joining us, I'm talking with Lady Bird Morgan. Um, please give this conversation a like and ask your questions now. So we're going to be getting to questions very soon here. So if you have burning questions or want to make comments, please do them now. Um, uh, Lady Bird, is there is there some learning that you hope that individuals, our our culture, or maybe in our healthcare system, takes away from this time? Hmm. I guess what I would I can speak for myself. What I'm hoping um, to take from this is to really um, listen to myself at a deeper level. Sort of what I spoke to about coming down and being with my grandmother. The initial response was that no, this is this can't happen and it's impossible and this is the way it's going to be. And if I had listened to that, I would have gone against everything inside of me and um, and I wouldn't have felt authentic. And I think with so much news out there, so many people talking constantly about everything, um, I hope that people can turn in a little bit more and really listen to that deeper part of themselves when they really know this is actually, that's what I see over there, but this is how I want to respond in this moment. Even if people get upset, even if it doesn't go with what you would normally have done, that um, people start to get their authentic voice and respond um, 
humanely. I, I don't agree with abandoning elders or anyone in times of crises. And this these choices that we're making right now out of the fear of dying is really not about living. Um, and my friend Sandy, I think she she reminded me, I think it was, she thought BJ had said this. So BJ, this is a quote of yours, great. And if it's not, if it's whoever else is. But, um, not on Facebook. That, so that, I, and, neither am I, but uh, he's, he'll find out. Um, living isn't about avoiding death, right? And that's so true. And so right now our responses to the coronavirus are about avoiding death. That's an important part. We don't want everyone to get sick and die, but that's not all of what living is about. And so if our decisions are only being you know, focused on how do we avoid death, we're forgetting about how do we tend to what's living. And that's what I want to, to remember is what's actually living. Wow, that's incredible. Um, that's a reframing you know, perspective that I, I hadn't thought about myself. Um, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to get to some audience questions here. We have so many. So uh, we have Alua Arthur. Um, hi, Alua. We, uh, she says, how can we get involved in this project? I think she means um, uh, the prison hospice project. And, and what kind of support do they need? Thank you for asking. Um, the support that we need is for um, the governor and for senators to know that this is something that we can have in prisons. I mean, ideally we get this rolled out in all of the California prisons and then prisons nationwide. So in terms of what we need in the prisons, we just need these programs to be supported, to happen, yeah. writing to people, um, putting the, getting the word out. One of our board members is Edgar Behrens who created and filmed the documentary Prison Terminal. And we will be providing online platforms to watch that documentary and have a conversation with our team about how to bring these programs into prison. So requesting that and just spreading the word is really the most help right now. Great. We have another question here. This is from Susan. What reasons do prison systems give for not um, setting up the inmate compassionate death programs that you referred to earlier at San Quentin? The primary one is, I feel, is lack of information. And Shoshana, you could you know, understand this too. Just because you go to medical school or you have a degree in anything doesn't mean that you're comfortable or understand being with end of life. And for a lot of medical professionals, that is not why they went into medicine. And most people that went to work in the prison system did not go into the prison system to provide hospice and palliative care. And so there's, a, there's an educational gap there around just understanding what does it actually mean? Um, financially, it's a win-win system. The system saves thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. So once they understand that it's actually not stressful, that it is possible, that you can still have custody, people can still remain safe, um, things can open up, but it really is an educational piece. It's not, you know, I don't want to say like, oh, everybody is just so inhumane and cruel and they don't care. That, mm -hmm. I don't believe that that is the gist of it. I think it really comes down to we're overwhelmed. We're already stressed out. This is not our expertise. So we know we're just not gonna look at it right now. Yep. We have a couple of questions. One is from Ian. Hey Ian, um, who is a, um, a hospice and palliative medicine new fellow at UCSF. Great. Um, what is the best, most direct way to stay connected with what's happening in prisons and how can we help to advocate as well as ocean Phillips also asking a question about, have you heard of ways that right now people can get involved with, with local um, prisons in their own areas? The best way is to just go and find out, you know, go to your local hospices and go to your local prisons and start asking questions there. I, I'm going to have the number wrong and I apologize for that, but there are under 200, you know, hospice prison programs in this country. Some of them are still active that started a while ago. Some of them have kind of dwindled out. It depends on the support, but you just find out what's available. Our website, Humane Prison Hospice Project, um, we do respond to people that write in and we're happy to, to talk with you in person about um, what's happening locally for you, how to stay involved. And again, going back to the documentary, Prison Terminal, it's a beautiful way for people to see a, a prison hospice program that was actually happening. It opens up your heart as you watch it and people tend to understand it differently when their heart is open. But please reach out to Humane Prison Hospice Project to me directly. I'm in San Francisco area. I'm happy to meet with and talk with anyone. So is Marvin and so is Sandy. We're all very um, available to talk. 
And we'll, once this is over, we'll pop those websites into the comments so people can know exactly where to go and, and access um, for sure. I think, a lot, I think you'll get a lot of probably um, comments uh, and, and messages Great. in from this. Um, Joe Garvey has a question. He thinks mm -hmm. Marvin maybe addressed this in his presentation, but how do you all address the cold but no doubt real attitude among citizens and probably government leaders of why should we put so much energy into someone who's clearly not respected society's norms and may in fact have received a life sentence or a death sentence? Um, mm -hmm. And of course, yes, so much admiration for you and what you're doing for humanity. Um, thank you, Joe. It's a great question. And yes, Marvin has addressed this beautifully, but it really speaks to how we care for incarcerated people is, speaks to our humanity. Choosing to uh, inflict suffering is, is, is on us. It's not on what they have done. So I, it kind of just goes back to that. You know, how do we as a society wish to respond to the humans in our world? Do we want to punish them and just let them suffer? Or do we actually want to provide some humane care. Yeah. It's probably not as articulate as Marvin, sorry, but that's really what it comes down to that. And you know, in prisons, especially Department of Corrections, I mean, this is state tax dollars. So it's not the prisons are these separate things over there. Your tax dollars go to paying for punishment and torture and lack of sanitation. So to really become more aware of, oh yeah, I'm actually, I'm involved in this. It isn't just those prisons, it's your prison. As Marvin would say, these are our prisons. These are our, our systems, prison. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, a question here from Sharon, um, but oh, I wanna remind folks, please ask your questions. We will be um, wrapping up pretty soon here. So if you have any final burning questions, please enter them in the comments. Um, this is from Sharon. Thank you for the work you're doing. It's truly inspiring. Are there any education or training programs in hospice care in prison for those who will that plan to re-enter back into the community? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, but I guess what I'll speak to is um, the men that are trained, and it depends on where you are, which prisons and which hospice programs. Most of these programs are for prisoners who are serving life, and so they're not actually eligible for parole. However, in San Quentin, the men that we trained, some of those men were eligible for parole. And what we said to them is that we would do our best to support their re-entry once they came out in terms of finding a way to use those skills. It's very, very hard to get work as a caregiver once you have a prison background. So that's another element to actually advocate for our, all of you doctors and nurses and social workers out there who want to see released men and women able to provide these skills is to start finding ways to create those programs where they're welcomed into the work field. Yeah. I hope that answered your question. I'm not sure. If you have it, it just email me <laughs> and I'll respond to it. Yeah. Um, question from Lisa. Um, do, we, we, you've talked about this uh, a lot already, but do the programs differ in, in various states based on state regulation about, as far as you know, well, what, what can be set up um, for end of life compassion programs? Yeah, I mean, they absolutely do. In fact, coming down here, I'm in Arizona, where my grandmother just died, and the hospice there is completely different in terms of the medications and how they use them than what I was familiar with in San Francisco. And when I came from Washington State, you know, we used different medications there and different uh, modalities. So it's fascinating. Basically, prisons are their own kingdoms, and they the warden gets to decide how things happen, and they talk to the chief medical officer, and they create what's going to happen. The more education they can have around options and what works and what's available, and the more supported they feel in providing those options, then I think, you know, that's those are the barriers. Is really just understanding what the options are and how to bring them in. Yeah. Um, well. Gosh, Lady Bird, thank you for this conversation. This mm -hmm. has been really amazing, a fantastic engagement from everybody out there watching. Thank you for all your questions and comments. Um, and, and everybody, we, we actually wanna hear from you. We wanna know at Endwell, how has COVID-19 changed how you feel about and prepare for serious illness, for caregiving, for the end of life? Uh, please go to endwellproject.org slash stories to share your story with us. Um, and we hope that you'll tune in next week for another conversation in the series. Uh, I want to thank again our sponsors, the Cambia Health Foundation and the Tauber Family Foundation for their support of this program. Lady Bird, thank you again so much. And, and to everyone that joined us uh, today, 
I hope that uh, you have a safe trip home and everybody uh, stay safe and stay well.